I have been tasked with um, giving you a, an overall um, taster, if you like, of almost all of the jurisdictional rules of uh, Brussels 1. So a bit of an overview on the actual jurisdictional rules, which is, of course, you know, in a way fairly straightforward, but also a little bit impossible in that, um, as I think has already been mentioned, and I will mention it again, the regulation, of course, is not an easy piece of legislation. It reads quite easily, I think, probably, perhaps not, um, but it's, you know, when you look at the detail, also quite puzzling. And it's one of those pieces of, of, of legislation which requires an, an awful lot of knowledge on what actually is behind many of these provisions and also um, um, how the European Court of Justice, and Talia has already referred to that, um, applies these provisions as well as, of course, the national um, courts. So it's a bit of a concertina presentation. I could talk about these. I, have, I don't know how many slides I have. I could talk about them for two weeks. Um, today I'll talk about them for um, two days. Uh, sorry, two days. Two, two hours. Two hours before you start getting worried. Two hours I have to basically go through this and I'll hope to make it about an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes so that we have some time for questions. I would suggest though actually that if, uh, if there's anything I say which is um, completely puzzling to you, uh, while I say it, then just interrupt me and uh, we can, um, you know, go into discussion straight away. If you have some more fundamental questions, then perhaps you should keep them for for afterwards. Let me see where I can put my, my watch. Um, okay, so as, uh, uh, um, as the uh, chair uh, person has already uh, very kindly mentioned, I have this blog, which many of the cases that I refer to, especially the newer cases, um, have a reference on the blog. And, and indeed, I try and follow the European Court of Justice's case law on uh, not just Brussels 1, but on today's topic, Brussels 1. And you will find that uh, many of those cases are referred there as well. So if I go a little bit fast for some of them, you needn't worry. There should be detail on the website. Some of this background, of course, has been mentioned already by Professor Kruger, and I needn't uh, perhaps go into detail on all of them. Um, perhaps to just flag one or two things. Uh, it's the issue of these reports, uh, reports which you see when you look at the European Court of Justice judgment on Brussels 1, uh, similar-ish on the Rome 1 Convention on, uh, and regulation on applicable law for contracts, and also the insolvency regulation, which has already been referred to. The court often refers to these reports, um, which is a little bit awkward because, of course, in European Union preparatory works, there's no such thing as reports as being a preparatory, uh, an official preparatory document of European Union law. But this, of course, refers to the history of these regulations, some of whom um, were preceded by a convention. Natalia already mentioned the Brussels Convention, the Lugano Convention, which is kind of a satellite of the Brussels um, Convention. And because these conventions were outside of the uh, formal EU framework, they couldn't have a Commission proposal, they couldn't have European Parliament opinions, and of course for the original Brussels Convention 1968, the European Parliament wouldn't have, that, wouldn't have had a say anyway, even if it had been um, EU law. And instead they have these reports, which have been drafted typically by civil servants of the Commission, or of the Member States, and or a number of um, academics. And the Court continues to refer to these reports as a source of inspiration, including these various reports for the Brussels 1 Convention. And indeed, the Brussels 1 Convention has quite a few of them because every single time new member states joined the European Union, they also were asked to join, um, almost, if you like, forced to uh, uh, join the Brussels um, Convention. And this was taken as an opportunity to slightly amend the Convention in certain parts. Um, which, of course, then necessitated a new report as well. And they're a bit of a treasure trove of information, um, but, of course, you have to read them carefully because, evidently, uh, they, they may have changed one or two provisions. Uh, and, and in the meantime, the Brussels 1 recast regulation that also already has been referred to, of course, has also changed some things. So be careful when you read these reports and refer to them. And, of course, the Court of Justice also emphasizes that one needs to read these reports mutatis um, Mutandis. Okay, um, I've mentioned this. Lugano has been mentioned. The new Lugano Convention 
Brussels 1 recast has been mentioned as well. The fact that the Brussels 1 recast only applies to proceedings initiated on or after the 10th of January 2015, uh, which of course means that there's an awful lot of proceedings out there which are still subject to the old rules um, and which will continue to be subject to the old rules right up until the final moment of final appeal and um, so on. That's of course also the case, perhaps even more, for the Rome 1 regulation on applicable law in contracts because that only applies to contracts concluded after 2009 and therefore there's an awful lot of those um, contracts out there in commercial practice which continue to be subject to the older rules of the Rome Convention, the 1980 Rome Convention. Perhaps if I may draw your attention to uh, an important judgment that is pending uh, in that case where the question is asked and the name of the case escapes me now, uh, a Greek case, um, it'll come back to me, where the, the question is asked um, when a contract changes substantially, a contract concluded before 2009 but changed substantially after 2009, does the Rome 1 regulation apply or not? And what sort of a change to the contract do you need for the new rules to apply as opposed to the um, um, old ones? The name of the case will come back to me hopefully um, after the uh, presentation. It may have also already been mentioned. Oops, I forget. I forget. Yeah, I forget to fast forward. Sorry, I'm looking at my screen here, but I forget to fast forward the slides. Thank you. Um, yeah. So these things I've mentioned: the reports, uh, the background, um, the Lugano Convention, and then the new dates of um, application. Thank you. Basically, I just want to all hypnotise you into dreaming about my blog and going into it. Uh, uh, um, so, uh, which of these two apply? This has already been mentioned. Domicile of the defendant, of course, is crucial but not entirely. There are a number of jurisdictional rules which, which apply regardless of the defendant. And um, this is something which will become clear as well throughout the course of my um, presentation. Denmark has also been uh, flagged and the, the curious position of Denmark but also of course of the United Kingdom and Ireland um, with respect to conflict of laws generally and as Professor Kruger mentioned indeed it's a bit awkward but it's explained effectively by the fact that of course uh, conflict of laws used to be part of the immigration and asylum chapter of the Treaty on the European Union and of course the, those three countries and especially the Danes and the Brits were, were always a bit reluctant to have the European Union medal in asylum and immigration affairs which explains why, explains why a conflict of laws has been is sort of hooked on to this exception uh, and opt out. The two, as you know, have a bit of a different regime. Denmark has negotiated for itself a fairly inflexible opt out, which requires this protocol, which we talked about at the very end of Professor Kruger's presentation. The UK and Ireland, I think, have the much better regime. They have a fairly flexible opt in, so they can simply notify without there being a need for a protocol between the EU and uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland whenever they want to um, enter into a European uh, private international law. Um, instrument. I wasn't aware of this Danish, uh, someone flagged the Danish uh, um, uh, notification and the fact that seemingly this has not been properly ratified by uh, the Danish um, uh, parliament, which I think is a very good exam question for an institutional law um, course. And I, it's the first time I hear it, I wasn't aware of it. So it's, it'll be interesting to, to think about it. I would agree, I think, uh, intuitively with what Professor Kruger mentioned, namely that it shouldn't be the concern for the EU as to whether or not these internal rules have been followed and the notification should suffice, but we'll, we'll see how that works out and I'm sure that some clever lawyer somewhere will make an issue um, out of this. Um, okay, so next slide. No, sorry, I'm going back. Yeah, overriding principles, these to some degree have also perhaps been mentioned. I apologize, I only came in towards the end of Professor Krug's presentation. Um, but they're worth pointing out because they continue to guide the European Court of Justice. Most of them are on this slide. So first of all, um, the principle of mutual trust. Uh, Turner, also Gasser. Um, these are important principles. I suppose the way it is explained is, when you go back to the history of the Brussels 1 regulation, initially the, um, and this is something which for instance at the moment is also going on at The Hague, at the, the Hague process, which is thinking about an international Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Judgments. This was also the initial task of the negotiators of the 1968 Brussels Convention. They were asked, please give us rules 
that will make it easier to have free movement of judgments. That was the initial starting point. And when they took stock, of course, it's the first thing you would do is, how are we going to go about doing this? Of course, you first take stock of the difficulties that exist. Why is it exactly that judgments uh, uh, are not uh, uh, entitled to, in certain circumstances, to recognition and enforcement? And it very quickly became apparent in the eyes of these negotiators that the main problem was that the absence of mutual rules on jurisdiction. So when they looked at the initial six member states a court practice on refusing recognition, they saw that in the vast majority of cases recognition was re refused because the court that was being asked to recognize didn't at all like the way in which the initial court had assumed jurisdiction. So you may have had Dutch courts saying, you Italian judge should have never heard this case on a Dutch real estate. Or you may have had a German court saying, you Belgian judge should have never heard this case on this contract because there was a choice of court in favor of a German court and so on and so forth. And this is, if you like, a bit of a leap of, well, a mission creep, perhaps an extension of the mission, I think by default, they were asked to harmonize recognition and enforcement. And they said, the only way we can do this is by harmonizing jurisdiction. And this ended up in an attempt in to large degree, I think, a fairly successful attempt to harmonize these jurisdictional rules to as much detail as possible. And the result of that is, I think, quite crucial because the Court of Justice, looking at this initial um, idea of the Brussels Convention and now also the Brussels 1 and Brussels 1 recast regulation, said, look, if we have established these fairly detailed mutual rules on jurisdiction, then we basically have to trust that the other courts will properly implement them. We have to trust our fellow courts in the member states that they will do a proper job in implementing it. And therefore, there will be very little wriggle room, very little room for manoeuvre for courts to second guess the way in which another court exercises its jurisdiction. That also leads to something which I think you'll talk about a little bit more um, this afternoon. It leads to these very strict list alibi pendants rules. Very strict rules that say when a case is already pending the same case between the same parties in another court, in another member state, then you have to keep away from the case, at least temporarily. You have to trust, you have to trust that the court in these other states will properly enforce the jurisdictional rules, if necessary, with the help of the Court of Justice. And this, of course, has led to abuse. It's led to the so-called torpedo actions, where you basically um, initiate a case in a court, e even in the full knowledge that this court doesn't have jurisdiction under the rules or the regulation, but where you're banking on a delay in the proceedings, or for instance, a stronger hand in negotiations with your counterparty. And I think it shouldn't be denied that this is definitely a practice that goes on in uh, international litigation, specifically in the EU. And it's, of course, also something which the new regulation has tried to address, at least for those instances where parties have agreed a choice of court amongst themselves. But that's something that we'll talk about um, this afternoon, uh, buried indeed in uh, mind. The regulation, as you see there on the third bullet point, refers or assigns jurisdiction to a particular member state. Um, uh, internal conflict of law rules are not an issue of the um, regulation. Of course, there's a, a number of member states that have internal conflict rules. The United Kingdom uh, is one of them. Spain um, is another. To some degree, perhaps in future, countries like Belgium, Germany, arguably, in one or two um, issues. But that's something that, not something that the regulation is um, concerned with. Of course, the member states may, in and of themselves, or on their own initiative, apply the regulation to internal uh, conflicts. Um, issues. What's well, also perhaps, this is not on this slide, but I would like to point it out and perhaps I'll signal it again when we go through the jurisdictional um, rules. The, um, when you read the jurisdiction rules, you have to always be very careful whether the rule says the courts of a member state or the courts in a member state. What I mean by that is that sometimes the regulation, and I'll, I'll flag it when we go through the rules, sometimes the regulation will identify a specific court in a member state, not just a member state, but a specific court in that member state. Special jurisdictional rules, for instance, are an example of this. In other instances, the regulation will simply assign a member state 
and we leave it to the internal civil procedure rules of that member state to then say which of these courts in that member state are um, do or do not have um, jurisdiction. It's quite an important difference, of course, because it means it may it obviously has an impact on uh, how the courts in that member state can or cannot look at this case. It's not because it's a German court that necessarily it's that German court that would have jurisdiction, for instance. But I'll flag it again when we go through one of the uh, a couple of the um, um, a couple of the. Um, uh, provisions. The final point is also quite uh, interesting and it's something which, and again I'll come back to it especially when we talk about contracts, something which the Court of Justice continues to struggle with and I think you can see why. The, what I have on the bullet point is there, it says it, talk, it harmonizes jurisdiction, it doesn't harmonize qualification. Um, basically, let me phrase it differently. The European private international law um, starts from the principle that all provisions in these regulations need to have or need to be given what is called an autonomous interpretation. An autonomous interpretation. In other words, that when the judgment, sorry, when the regulation says a judgment, or when the regulation says a contract or a tort um, or uh, rights in REM, then that is not a concept that should be left to the member states to define. And you can see why. If you're going to have harmonizing rules like in the Brussels 1 regulation, and every single member state interprets rights in REM differently and contract differently and judgment differently, then you've ended up not harmonizing all that much. Because if they all have different interpretation of what those words actually mean, then you have a different application of those rules. So in a way, it's not surprising that the Court of Justice should say we need to have one harmonized approach towards these things. However, the regulation being applicable to civil and commercial matters, including contract, tort, etc., evidently it touches upon hardcore private law notions, which in most member states have been developed over centuries. Right. Um, and of course, the European Commission generally, and the European Union generally, would like there to be more harmonization in private law if only because of consumer protection issues, if only because of internal market issues, etc. But they're finding it very difficult to achieve this. A good example of this is the so-called DCFR, which you may be familiar with, the Draft Common Frame of Reference, which is a, an academic attempt for a, a use commune in private law in the member states. A very interesting attempt but not something which the member states are ready to adopt as the European law on contracts or the European law on unjust enrichment or the European law on tort, etc. So there's a, a, a kind of um, tension, if you like, between on the one hand the regulation necessarily having to impose an autonomous interpretation for otherwise it risks being applied differently in 28 member states and on the other hand, the member states in those same issues of all those private law categories, having specifically signaled, look, we're not going to have some sort of a European use commune, and if we're going to have it, it's going to be very, very slow by the time we reach it. And you can see that the Court of Justice struggles with this. We don't have time to go into too much detail about this, but I mentioned a case there, Jakob Hunter, which is an, uh, a crucial case on the concept of contract within Brussels 1, right? And Calfelis, another case, K-A-L-F-E-L-I-S, Calfelis is one of those core cases on what it is to be, or what a tort is within the Brussels um, regulation. But you can see that the court struggles with how it should define a contract. Right? And for instance, it says for tort that all relations in tort are those that are not freely, that where parties have not freely engaged in. That's a definition of tort that is difficult to apply in practice and that certainly leaves open an awful lot of questions. And a contract would then mean a relationship which parties have freely or voluntarily engaged in. That as well, though, leaves an awful lot of questions um, uh, on things like agency, duress, consideration, for instance, under the English um, common law, which are not at all harmonized by the European regulation. So I think especially when you look at the special jurisdiction rules on contracts and torts, and when you read some of those judgments, 
and the opinions of the Advocate General, you will see that the EU struggles with this. It needs to have an autonomous interpretation for the purposes of the Brussels 1 recast, but it hasn't really got one when it looks at all the attempts that have been made by member states in the area of private um, law. And it explains sometimes why you will find that those judgments are somewhat um, byzantically phrased, I think, um, when it comes to such core um, principles. A number of other rules which I think are in interesting and important to point out. We'll see in a minute, this will be on the next slide, an overview of so-called, um, uh, what I call a matrix, the various jurisdictional rules of the regulation in descending order of exclusivity, if you like, in descending order of room for um, uh, uh, change to those principles. And you will see that in that matrix, domicile of the defendant actually comes quite low. There are many jurisdictional rules that are much stricter than the domicile of the defendant. Yet, Article 4 of the regulation posits domicile of the defendant as the basic rule of the regulation. The basic rule of the regulation is, where should you sue? You should sue in the domicile of the defendant. That's the core rule. And then it has many exceptions, which we'll see um, in a minute. Despite the basic rule being um, overruled by plenty of other rules, it continues to be defined as the basic rule. And the result of that is that the Court of Justice emphasizes that the, any rule of the regulation which deviates from that core rule of Article 4 needs to be applied restrictively. Right? Needs to be applied restrictively. Only needs to be applied for the specific circumstances intended by the regulation. And how do you find those specific circumstances intended by the regulation? You find it, of course, in all those reports that I've mentioned, and now also, of course, in the Commission proposals and the institutional discussions of the Brussels 1 and the Brussels 1 recast. So it's quite important to know why this particular rule has been included in the regulation so as to make sure that you only apply it in the specific circumstances so intended. And we'll come back to that again when we look at some of those um, jurisdictional, uh, jurisdictional um, rules. As a note of interest, there's a discussion going on at the moment, including in case law, which is quite an important discussion, on the exclusions, and Professor Kruger has already looked at the exclusions, so I won't look um, at them um, uh, uh, in, in any detail. The discussion is whether the exclusions, the excluded areas of the regulation, so those matters that are clearly civil and commercial, but that are nevertheless excluded from the regulation, whether these also should be applied restrictively, much like any exception to Article 4 needs to be applied restrictively. An English case law, for instance, at the moment, there's quite a lot of case law going on on the wills and succession exception to the regulation. Of course, also, interestingly, somewhat in conjunction with the European succession regulation. Why do I say interestingly? Because here you see English courts making reference to the EU succession regulation, so the inheritance regulation, if you like, in conflicts of laws, even though the UK is not bound by the succession regulation. The High Court, Court of Appeal, have already used the succession regulation to help interpret the provisions of the Brussels 1 um, recast. And they suggest that there needs to be a restrictive interpretation of the exceptions. I'm not too sure. Um, and I don't think it's merely um, semantic. It's quite important for a lot of inheritance issues, for instance, related to trusts and, in, and inheritance management using trusts. Um, where uh, the, the fact whether or not they're included in Brussels 1 or the recast is quite um, crucial. A similar issue, of course, concerns, and again, I won't talk about it in great detail, but it basically it, or it sort of uh, links to a discussion which you had at the very end of the last presentation, is the insolvency exception in the Brussels 1 recast. Very important discussion, um, and... I would agree with what our uh, uh, chair uh, uh, has said on the relationship between the insolvency regulation and the Brussels 1 recast. And the jargon that is typically used to describe that regulation is by use of the word dovetail. So the question is whether the exclusion of Brussels 1 recast dovetails with the scope of application of the insolvency regulation. In other words, if a proceeding relates to insolvency within Brussels 1 recast, therefore is excluded 
from the Brussels One recast, does that also magically mean that it is covered by the insolvency regulation, which, as you probably know, um, also has been amended uh, that will enter into force in 2017? The answer is clearly no. The answer is clearly no. There are quite a few insolvency proceedings, in my view, which indeed are excluded from Brussels One, but which are not included in the insolvency regulation and which therefore fall outside uh, both of these um, instruments. And again, that's quite important, of course, uh, for a lot of international uh, litigation issues. Yeah, um, the other points perhaps I shouldn't talk about too uh, much. Yeah. Um, let's move to the... So this is the matrix. This is the matrix. This, I think, is quite... Um, uh, hopefully you agree, an interesting slide, because this is, I think, how practice should address the various jurisdictional rules of the regulation. So basically, what you need to do when you are a court, or indeed when you are a party representing someone, is you need to go through this matrix, check whether your um, subject matter fits within uh, number one or not, and then just go through the list and eventually end up with uh, an establishment of jurisdiction or not as the case uh, may be. And I'll go through each of those um, in a little bit of... Uh, of course, you'll get these slides. I'm sorry I haven't sent them beforehand. I apologise, but, but of course you will, you will evidently um, get them. So I'll go through each of them and I'll just highlight a number of um, issues concerning each. And I'll take the text and I suggest perhaps you do the same if you have it in front of you. I'll take the text of the regulation in front so it'll be easier to... Um, follow. So just a few words, rights in REM and tenancies of, this is Article 24, so in the hierarchy, the highest uh, jurisdictional rule, um, where basically the, the reason why the regulation has these exclusive jurisdictional rules is first of all very practical, it relates to what I said earlier. The jurisdictional rules included in Article 24 are the very jurisdictional rules where before 1968, member states routinely refused recognition of other member states' courts. Right? So from the moment you had, for instance, looking at Article 24.1, a Belgian court doing a, or, 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 or issuing a judgment on the right in rem relating to a French uh, real estate, French courts would say, we will not recognize and enforce this. We should have heard this case and not you. So it's a very practical reason as to why there should be these exclusive jurisdiction rules. But there's also a more conceptual content reason why, or that is at least is being put forward as a justification for including those exclusive jurisdiction rules. And that is basically a link between jurisdiction and applicable law. For almost all of the exclusive jurisdictional rules included in Article 24, in the applicable law stage, it will be also the law of those courts that will apply to the case at issue. And therefore, the assumption is, for these categories, the regulation says, look, it would actually be rather handy, if not crucial, if for proceedings relating to a right in rem on real estate, where lex re citae will apply, so the law of the place where that real estate is situated, that it would also then be the courts of that place that will hear that case. Which explains, for instance, why Article 24.1 writes in REM. So when you read it, it says, in proceedings which have as their object rights in REM in immovable property or tenancies of immovable properties, course of the member state in which the property is situated. Tenancies in immovable property are included. Right? Tenancy agreements are included. Why is that? Mostly because back in 1968, what was really thought about were not the sort of, even though they are actually included, were not the sort of lease agreement between myself and a landlord if I go and live abroad, right? But rather, typically, the lease agreements between a farmer and the um, landlord uh, when it comes to long-term tenancy of agricultural land. That was mostly thought about in Article 24, where indeed you do have very long established rules, often local even, not just national, customary rules perhaps, that would be applied to that particular relationship. So you get a, an argument saying, it's an argument of, I think I've already mentioned, Gleichlauf, right? 
So where applicable law and competent court are basically from the same state, Gleichlauf. You have concurrence between the law that applies and the court that hears the case. Now, I do wonder, and I mentioned a case there, a recent case, uh, 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 the autumn of 2015, Komu and Komu, a Finnish case, but where there was an inheritance relating to real estate in Spain. And as often happens in these cases, there's a dispute between the, um, um, uh, between the um, uh, descendants. Um, they disagree on what should happen with the real estate, and in the end it needs to be sold. Right? So you had a Finnish court ordering the sale of this Spanish um, property. And the question then was the discussion, the ensuing discussion on the sale and the um, obligatory sale, does that relate to a right in rem on an immovable property? And the Court of Justice said, yes, it does. Why? Well, because and it goes back to this argument. It says, well, if it has to be sailed forcibly, then it will have to be in a Spanish auction using Spanish rules. It will have to take place in Spain. It may even have to be an involvement of a Spanish notary. And therefore, it would be best if it's only Spanish courts that hear this case. I, honestly, I think that's nonsense in many modern applications of um, rights in REM in immovable property. I can't see why given modern, you've been explained about the European Judicial Network, you've seen the amount of information that is available, admittedly not entirely satisfactorily, but there's an awful lot that can actually be done um, and that can be consulted from abroad. And I don't see why a Finnish court should not be able to um, rule on issues relating to rights and rem in Spanish real estate. I simply don't see it. I can imagine it in 1968. I don't see it now. If we can have key oil surgery, then why can't we have these kinds of uh, discussions in uh, Article 24. But that's just me, because, you know, whatever I say, this is going to stay the case for a very, very long time. Um, do notice, though, that you see in Article 24, you see that the, um, uh, first of all, what I mentioned earlier, so if you look at Article 24, one, it says, the courts of the member state in which the property is situated, right? It doesn't say the court in the member state where the property is situated. No, it says it's the member state, the courts in the member state where the property is situated. Which particular court that is, then is down to internal civil procedure, right? which, as it happens, of course, also very often will be the locus rei citai, the very local court where this estate is actually situated, unless you might have a central court that needs to deal, for instance, with all auctions of real estate, thinking off the top of my head. But it's down to your own internal civil procedure um, rules. Notice, secondly, that all of the provisions of Article 24 um, talk about proceedings which have as their object, which have as their object. In other words, not just any proceeding where these kinds of issues are at stake will fall under the exclusive jurisdictional rule, right? No, it has to be proceeding with a specific object to establish real estate rights in, or rights in RAM in real estate, or with the specific object to talk about the validity of uh, decisions of bodies of a company, for instance, to talk about Article 24 too. So it's not just any proceeding, it's, um, only the proceedings which have as their specific object. An important exception to that is Article 24.4 on intellectual property, which I'll get to um, in a minute. Now, this is quite important, right? And of course, it also means that when you phrase your initial um, uh, application to a court, how you phrase it and what you ask of the court will have an impact on whether or not Article 24 will be engaged. Um, something which practitioners often um, forget, but the way in which you phrase your initial application to the court will, to some degree, have an impact on whether or not the court that you've seized actually has jurisdiction. So that's, I think, quite important to um, bear in mind, and there's plenty of case law on that from not just the European Court of Justice, but also um, national um, courts. And also bear in mind, by the way, that not all language versions of the regulation are as clear 
on that issue as the English one. Now, for instance, the, friend, the Dutch one is certainly not um, as clear uh, on that particular point, uh, but that's the way the Court of Justice has interpreted it. A good example, indeed, is the second um, uh, uh, point which you see there. Right? So the second, the second point of um, Article 24.2 relates to the so-called corporate um, 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 jurisdiction. In proceedings which have as their object the validity of the constitution, nullity or dissolution of companies, etc., or the validity of the decisions of their organs. Which court is competent? The court of the member states, excuse me, the courts of the member state in which the company, etc., has its seat. Has its seat. In order to determine that seat, the court shall apply its rules of private international law. That last element is an exception to the um, attempt at harmonizing uh, domicile, corporate domicile, under Article 60 of the um, regulation. The court has had to apply this provision quite regularly, and an important case here is Befauge, which you see also on the slide, Befauge. Because what very often happens, of course, in practice is that this, the validity, that the validity of decisions of bodies of a corporation are engaged in a discussion on almost any relationship that you might have with that corporation. Typical example, there is a choice of court agreement, and you sue so you've agreed between parties that you will sue in the courts of a particular member state. You are the plaintiff. You go and sue in that state. And as way of by way of defense, the defendant, which is a corporation, says, ah, well, yes, but we should have never, we could have never agreed to this contract or to this choice of court. For instance, they will say our bylaws very specifically state that for any purchase or any contract worth more than 5 million euros, it has to be the, 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 board, the board of directors that needs to sign. It can't just be one of the directors, for instance. Right? So they basically invoke the invalidity of a decision of the uh, 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 corporation to try and argue that the court at issue doesn't have jurisdiction. There the Court of Justice has said in Befauge, this, this doesn't engage, this doesn't trigger Article 24.2. It doesn't trigger Article 24.2, which again means it's only if a, a plaintiff specifically goes to court to, to, uh, to request that the court um, uh, 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 state that a particular corporate decision is invalid, then Article 24.2 will be triggered. Not if it comes up by way of defense. Yeah. The way, the, way the, or the, the, the justification of the Court of Justice for this limited or perhaps slightly limited scope of application of Article 24.2 is that it says if we don't have that limitation, then basically whether or not Article 24.2 will be engaged depends on whether or not the defendant actually raises this defense. And that the Court of Justice said that would run counter legal certainty, which is also one of the guiding principles of the regulation. That would run counter legal certainty. You need to know beforehand, even before any conflict arises, which court or courts, as the case may be, will have jurisdiction to hear the case. Anything that upsets that certainty just cannot go ahead within the application of the regulation. No? Yes? What happens if the defendant um, use a counterclaim and it's asking for the validity of the accord of the society of the company. I think that would likewise not engage Article 24.2. By way of counterclaim. Yeah, no. I don't think it would, but it's a good question. It's a good question. So where indeed the court just simply, or the, the defendant doesn't just simply say this is invalid, but actually says, look, by way of counterclaim, I want it to be specifically stated that. I don't think that would trigger Article 24.2, no. Which again indeed explains this, or you know, points to this very important idea of the race to court, right? And indeed, amongst litigators, it is well known that the last thing you should do when you're in a dispute with a commercial party is to send them an email. I was going to say a fax, um, but that gives away my years of practice. To send them an email where you say, and if you don't answer by Friday, we will sue. Right? That's the worst you can do in practice, because if you then have a, a mildly clever Opponent, opponent counsel, then they will start suing on Thursday, of course, right, in a, in a different court. Right. But a very good question. I would say, no, it's not engaged. 
Now, interestingly, though, oh, perhaps just flag this KA Finance case, but it's, uh, I flag it because it's a, one of the few cases where this so-called corporate rule has been applied by the Court of Justice, but KA Finance is in the context, or Finance is in the context of the Rome 1 regulation, where Lex Societatis issues are excluded from the scope of application of Rome 1. Right. So you have to be a bit careful applying KA Finance to Article 24.2 because it's obviously not quite the same. And indeed, in the end, the Court of Justice managed, I think, quite cleverly to bypass the real issues um, under the Rome 1 um, regulation in KA Finance uh, by making reference to secondary law on uh, corporate harmonization. But if, you, if you're interested in that, look it up. The um, judgment is, is on the block. Now, interestingly, uh, a, a bit of an, an awkward uh, provision in Article 24, or at least the way in which the Court of Justice has interpreted it. Article 24 talks about, 24.4 talks about intellectual property. So if you have the text in front of you, it says, in proceedings concerned with the registration or validity of patents, trademarks, designs, etc., where the courts of the member state in which the deposit of the registration has been applied for, uh, and so on, um, should have taken place or is deemed to have taken place. Uh, a few words on that. First of all, this exception is also engaged even if the validity of this intellectual property right is raised, or the invalidity of it, is raised by way of defense. Uh, this is Gat and Luke, uh, case law of the European Court of Justice, but confirmed repeatedly since. And this is a very important difference with Article 24.1 and Article 24.2, also 3 and 5, but I don't talk about 3 and 5. They're slightly less important in practice. Right? So, even if raised by way of defense. This, of course, also is a very reoccurring element. Right? The moment you sue for infringement of intellectual property rights, the classic or one of the classic defenses of your opposing counsel is to say, yes, but your patent wasn't valid anyway, right? or your design or your trademark. Right? Copyright is different because it doesn't need to be registered. You know, this trademark doesn't exist, or it doesn't apply in this territory or something like that. So you raise the invalidity of the intellectual property right, an almost a knee-jerk uh, uh, argument uh, of uh, uh, defending counsel in intellectual property cases. Here the Court of Justice says, even if it is raised by way of defense, Article 24.4 will be engaged. <laughs> now what is still unclear, and the recast hasn't, I think, I'm not quite sure why, I think it's a bit of a, a missed opportunity, they haven't clarified whether this means that the court that has been engaged and then is faced with this Article 24.4 exception, or confronted, needs to relinquish the case fully. So in other words, needs to say, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong court, go and sue in Ljubljana, or whatever it may be. Or whether they need to say, we are going to halt our proceedings, you go to Ljubljana to have your intellectual property right established or not. Once you've got that judgment, you come back to us, and then we'll start talking about damages. Right? That's not at all clear. Which of the two it should be? But if you have to give a reasoned decision on why to stay, the decision to stay, doesn't that require jurisdiction? Because otherwise you can't write a reasoned decision. Yeah, but they would, for instance, you might, be, you might have jurisdiction, typically in intellectual property cases, on the basis of Article 7, either contract or damage 7-2. Yeah. So indeed you would say, I am the court, who, um, other than the issue of validity of the intellectual property right, I certainly have jurisdiction because the da damage has, is located in my territory. But, uh, but if the defendant takes, takes it away by raising the defense of invalidity, yeah. do you still have the jurisdiction uh, to write a reasoned judgment? I would say so, because you would still have the underlying jurisdiction on the basis of Article 7.3. Yeah. Uh, 7.2, sorry. 5.3, uh, 7.2. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you, you still continue to have that, that, that sort of substantive jurisdiction, yes. No. Um, perhaps, and it's interesting for you to know, perhaps, and I think I'll refer to it later when I, no, I'll talk about it later when I look at the recast. Sorry. Um, okay, so that's intellectual property. Now, one, and this I cannot talk about too much, if only because I'm not an intellectual property lawyer, um, and I've been trying to understand this proviso, but in the meantime, the recast has already been amended to basically make way for the Unified Patent Court, the UPC, and the Unified Patent Convention. And this is Article 78, I think, 
biz, etc. Probably of the regulation. Well, I can tell you, but uh, it's Article 70. Um, uh, sorry, 71A. Excuse me, 71A and following of the of the regulation. So it's already been amended. It takes account of the newly established Unified Patent, Conven uh, Patent Court as a result of the convention. Uh, and it introduces, in my view, a fairly complicated system of distribution of powers or jurisdiction between the Patent Court and courts in ordinary. Right? But to be honest, I'm going to have to ask you not to ask any questions on that because I don't quite understand it. I think you need to be an intellectual property lawyer to appreciate it. But it's something which is going to be quite important in practice. Um, also confusing because one of the interfering factors there is that you then also still have the Benelux Convention on trademarks, etc., and the Benelux Court, which also somehow sits in between all these jurisdictional rules. Right? So it's a bit of a a bit of a complex um, um, issue. But be aware of it. The moment you see intellectual property rights, um, ask someone, but not me. <laughs> Um, okay, so that's Article um, 24. Um, of course, Article 24, but you'll talk about them when you talk about our, our list of dependence. Article 24, why is it the highest in the hierarchy or in the matrix? That is because it's one of those very rare occasions where indeed a court that is being asked to recognize and enforce a judgment that has been issues in, issued in violation of Article 24, not just can, but has to, has to refuse recognition and enforcement. So it's one of the very few occasions where in the third step, so in the recognition and enforcement step of private international law, you can actually refuse to recognize and enforce. A very important uh, 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 consideration, um, therefore. Voluntary appearance, Article 26. I won't say too much um, about that. I think that's more or less um, straight um, forward, including the proviso which Article 26 included after some discussions at the Court of Justice and in national courts, which says that if you voluntarily appear, which of course you can't do in matters included in Article 24, so you cannot do it for matters that have exclusive jurisdictional rules in Article 24, for all other matters you can. When you voluntarily appear, Article 26 says that when you appear to contest jurisdiction and even to discuss the case on the merits, then you are not assumed to have um, uh, uh, submitted to the jurisdiction of the court. That's, of course, because in the civil procedure of many member states, when you first appear in a case, you can, of course, you're perfectly entitled to, to uh, argue on the basis of jurisdiction, but many judicial procedure codes will oblige you to also start pleading on the merits, right? That may then lead to an interim judgment where the court will deal with the issue of jurisdiction, but very often uh, the judicial code will say you have to also start pleading on the merits. And of course, Article 26 says it's not because you already start pleading on the merits that you are volunt voluntarily submitting. But it does say that you need to, if you do contest jurisdiction, then you need to flag it at the very first possibility. Right? Very first possibility. Typically, the very first appearance in the court, but in some member states it may be, for instance, in the very first written submissions, if that comes sooner than an actual appearance in the court. So basically, in, in limine litis, the sooner the better. And don't forget to do it. Don't wait until um, you have final written submissions to do it, because then it might be um, too late. Then we have the protected categories, and I think Professor Kruger has mentioned one or two things um, about this already, so I won't say perhaps um, too much about it. Um, yeah, so these are, this is something which you find in European private international law across all regulations, including inapplicable law, is this idea that, the, um, that there are a certain uh, category of uh, litigants out there, of parties out there, who can never really, that's the assumption, that even if they agree to something, they can't really have agreed to it because they are in an economically weaker position. Employees, consumers, uh, and also insured persons, but only when it concerns small um, risks. The assumption is, even if you agree to a choice of court or to a choice of law, because you are the weaker party, you've basically been you know, forced into agreeing to this, right? Because if you are, if you're just a consumer who buys something over the internet and you tell um, 
computer.com. Um, I would like to buy your amazing laptop, but I don't agree to your choice of court in favor of the courts of Delaware. Then basically computer.com will say, well, then you can't buy our computer, right? Um, so you have to agree to it. That's the assumption. The same with employees. If um, uh, low cost carrier limited tells you um, we will employ you, but you need to agree to your employment contract being subject to Raritanian law. And if, you, if there is a dispute, you'll have to go to Raritanian courts and you're looking for a job, then of course you'll agree to this, right? Because you want the job, even if you don't really want to go and sue in Raritania or want Raritanian law to apply. Just to be sure, Raritania, of course, is not an existing uh, member, states, member state. It's a state which conflict law is used so as not to insult uh, people, otherwise we always have to say Russia or something and then uh, inevitably of course there's Russians in the room and then all sorts of problems arise. And I shouldn't have said that because they now I probably have insulted someone. So, um, Raritania. Um, okay, so the, uh, and Professor Kruger I think has already referred to this and again you may see some more detail on it in the afternoon. So basically it means that um, a choice of, the choice is kind of limited. Um, not entirely, because you know the choice re is resurrected whenever the lit litigation starts. So from the moment there is a dispute, then you can start agreeing amongst each other again to go to a particular court. The reason for that is that the regulation assumes, look, if the dispute has arisen, and, is, and if a case has been initiated, then you've consulted a lawyer. right? And your lawyer should have told you what your rights are. And if in the full knowledge of those rights you still agree to go to a particular court, then okay. You know, then it's your choice. Um, and, and, and that does sometimes happen uh, in um, practice. What's important here, of course, is this element of direction. And I also mention it because of the last point, which you see there on the bullet point. Uh, Talia has already mentioned that, of course, on this point, the recast is, differs quite considerably from the initial regulation. Consumers, the consumer title of the regulation and the employment title of the regulation now also apply even if the defendant, which then in those cases would be the company involved, isn't domiciled in the EU, right? Isn't domiciled in the EU. That's an important difference with the Brussels 1 regulation. Now, beforehand, if you were computer.com established in the United States, or if you were lowcarrier.com established outside of the EU, you escaped the regulation. Right? That's, that, that's the long and the short of it. Now you no longer do. But, of course, for consumer contracts, you will only be engaged by the regulation as an ex-EU established company if you have directed your activities at the European Union and specifically at the member state in question. That's the result of the criteria of Article 17 and following of the um, regulation. So companies, businesses need to direct their activities other than for two default contracts such as um, purchase of a uh, movable good on installment terms, but outside of those default contracts, you will only be covered by the consumer title if you as a company have directed your activities at the member state of the consumer's domicile. Now, in the past, this was direct marketing, right? Direct marketing. So if you received flyers through the post, but of course, direct marketing, even though it stubbornly continues to exist, I'm not quite sure why, but I still get all these things through my letterbox. But of course, direct marketing, of course, is, is, has to a large degree been replaced with uh, 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 spam and phishing emails, right? Uh, and also, of course, websites. Surf, consumers surf the web and find stuff by surfing the web. So the court, of course, has had to find or has had to rule on how this criterion of directing at relates to the internet age. When can you say in the internet age that a company has directed their activities at a particular member state? Very important judgment, Pama Alpenhof. Pama Alpenhof. And the best thing to do is just look at the judgment and, le and see the criteria. The Court of Justice says it depends on the language used in the regulation. Interesting, because actually Council and Commission had agreed that language shouldn't be a point. But the Court says, yes, it does. It matters what language you use, right? Um, the currency that you use, the presence of directions on your website, right? all those things together. Be a little bit um, 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 smart about this, but I mean, it's not, or, or it's, it's, if you like, a basket of criteria, right? The Court of Justice doesn't use or doesn't use that term, but that's what it means. It's a basket of criteria. So it's not because, not simply because a website 
users. Let's say that you have a Belgian art dealer um, of a vint or a vintage shop that has English on its website, right? Why? Because it finds that this is sexy, attractive, it'll youngsters want it. Um, it might even have a student audience in the city where it is, which, you know, doesn't read Dutch or French or German, right, if you're in Belgium. So they use English on their website. The very use of English doesn't mean that they are directing their activities outside of Belgium, right? You'd have to have other things in there. For instance, if the website also mentions, we ship to all EU countries, well, then, okay, then you, you're obviously assuming that you're going to be visited by more than just Belgian consumers, right? Or you can pay in euros or in pounds sterling. Or if you want to come and inspect your wonderful second-hand vintage lamp, then, you know, here are directions to our showroom. Uh, if you come from Brussels Airport, then take the E40 and so on and so forth. Then, then you're obviously directing your activities towards countries other than your own um, country. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's for consumers and employees. Um, what's also important to point out is, and this is often why establishment of jurisdiction on the basis of these, especially employment contracts and consumer contracts, is important, is because it triggers the application of Rome 1, the regulation on applicable law in contracts. Yeah? So you will not just have a European court hear the case, but by virtue of Rome 1, that European court will also be obliged to apply a certain amount of minimum standards of European consumer law, European employment law, excuse me, European data protection law, etc. Right? That's why this provision and this extension has, was so contested by the likes of Apple, Google, Facebook, eBay, and so on. Google and Facebook don't care that they need to sue or that they are being sued in Ljubljana or in Leuven, or in, um, uh, uh, I don't know, Birmingham, right? They don't, you know, that, that doesn't matter to them. They just pay some local law and they'll sue, sue the case for them. That's not an issue. But they do care being subject to European consumer protection law, European employment law, right? Even though they're headquartered in California and so on. That's why they were upset about this extension. And the bridge between Brussels 1 and Rome 1, I think, is quite, um, quite important. Okay, I did say I would have to dip into and uh, perhaps sometimes um, leave you somewhat frustrated because I can only highlight uh, that many things, but still hopefully I think it, it's highlighting the most important um, elements. Choice of court, Article 25. Now this is something that you will also look at this afternoon, so I will not say too much um, about it, especially not in terms of the changes made by the recast um, regulation. A classic, uh, so let me, um, and this again you see here a similarity between Brussels 1, excuse me, and Rome 1. So between jurisdiction and applicable law. In terms of choice of court, so a so-called forum clo clause, where you agree that you will sue in a particular member state, or preferably even in a particular court in a particular member state, the regulation's philosophy is that it shouldn't be too obsessed with formality, <clears throat> right? That it shouldn't be too concerned um, about um, form formal rules, um, uh, proof, and so on. The only thing it's concerned with is to make sure that somehow it is established that parties have indeed freely agreed to choose a particular court or sometimes particular courts plural, to take their case. Right? So it's a, a kind of uh, attempt to make sure that it's not over-formalized, but that you nevertheless are able to establish consent. That's similar in Rome 1. In Rome 1, choice of law or governing law. In Rome 1, the regulation isn't a stickler for formalities. All it wants is that your choice of law is what it calls clearly established. Clearly established whether it be in writing, whether it be verbal but then agreed in writing, or whether it even be as a result of long-standing commercial relationships in which you've always agreed to sue somewhere and or to have a certain law applied. So it's fairly, fairly flexible, but nevertheless wants to make sure that consent is actually um, established. And this has led to a number of pivotal cases. You see them there, Segura, for instance, which talked about this classic example which 
uh, again, it's kind of sli slowly perhaps uh, uh, dying off, but it's the usual thing that you get when you used to go to a shop and you order something, you get an order form, and of course at the back of it will be general terms and conditions. Right? General terms and conditions, which of course you never read, um, uh, but which nevertheless um, apply. So inevitably, of course, the question came, you know, what if, like most of us, I haven't read these things, but the other party still actually um, um, uh, wants to call upon those standard terms and conditions. And the court basically wants that to be, well, the court sort of assumes that you have to be a cautious, uh, we have to be cautiously engaged in international business, that if you've been given the opportunity to consult those standard terms and conditions, and as this has been pointed out to you, then you are bound by them. The classic example used to be, if there are standard terms and conditions at the flip side of an order form, then the front side has to refer to the standard terms and conditions, right? Notice, the Court of Justice in Segura and so on doesn't say the front side has to refer verbatim to the fact that those standard terms and conditions have a choice of court agreement in them. Right? That's, that's not required. You simply have to say standard terms and conditions apply. Right? Now, the modern variety of this, of course, which is, I think, increasingly relevant, in a modern variety, of course, again, you don't tend to go to a shop and get a paper order form. You tend to email or tick boxes on websites. Um, uh, click wrap agreements, they're called. Right? Click wrap agreements, where you just tick a box and up, you have a contract and you agree to the standard terms and um, conditions. Here, the Court of Justice has said um, that the, specifically with the case of click wrap agreements, that if there is a possibility, and this is an important condition, but the moment there is a possibility for you as a consumer to read and also save or print those standard terms and conditions, typically, for instance, by use of a pop up, I think it's called. Um, or a new window that opens, for instance, right? The moment you have that opportunity, the court says, well, then, a little bit like in Segura for the paper version, then we, we're going to assume that you could have read it, potentially should have read it, and you're going to be bound by what is in those um, agreements. Be careful, of course, this is Article 25. This is not in the context of a consumer contract, right, where different things apply. And you also have the Consumer Protection Directive and the E-Commerce Directive that has a number of provisions on consumer um, contracts. But to give you an example, some litigation uh, 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 in England, but there's similar cases in, uh, uh, in Germany, where you have often even automated uh, orders going back and forth, especially in the financial sector, right? Um, so you may be selling and buying a million shares in 3,000 transactions, if not more, uh, at any given hour, if you're a city trader or if you're a trader in a bank in Frankfurt or in Amsterdam, etc. And most of this is done automatically. Emails are sent back and forth, all sorts of order forms going back and forth. And of course, all of those order forms at the bottom will have a header, uh, sorry, a footer, if it's at the bottom, it will say the standard terms and conditions of, I don't know, Morgan Stanley apply to this transaction, right? So basically, um, what you need to make sure is that if you are such a, um, a company, is that you basically have the proper management or proper kind of um, uh, uh, file management rules that you would also have had where you're still working with, written, with, with printed forms. Right? One of the classic things in the past was when the standard terms and conditions changed, you had to always tell your client, you make sure that you have a proper program that makes all the old forms disappear, right? Why? Because the inevitable temptation for many of the, if you, for instance, a large chain of, of, of stores, and you have something like 250 stores across one member state, then the temptation, of course, is that one store manager will say, I'm not going to throw all that paper, it's still perfectly fine. I'm going to use this paper until they've, the, they've run out, and then I will start using the new order forms. Why would I throw such a, you know, it's a waste of paper, it's, a, it's an expense. So they kept on using the old order forms with the old standard terms and conditions in them, which of course was not quite what you wanted. Similarly, in an electronic context, you need to make sure that you throw away the old standard terms and conditions. And how do you do that? By basically listing them neatly, for instance, by saying, 
Morgan Stanley's Standard Terms and Conditions version 2.1 uh, date 16th of April 2016 apply, right? Consult them on morganstanley.com and then you go to Morgan Stanley and on Morgan Stanley then it should be a neat page saying what are the st st standard terms and conditions, version 1.0, version 2.0 and so on and so forth. It's no different from the paper uh, management that one used to uh, uh, have to do. And there's a case here which I think I mentioned Perhaps I don't. Brussels Court of Appeal, for instance, similar case on electronic correspondence and then an electronic, just a signature saying, I agree. Uh, and then it turned out that somewhere in that chain, the vendor had actually mentioned standard terms and conditions, which, it, as it happened, were no longer listed on the website. Right? That's foolish. That's like throwing away your paper form. Um, so if you're going to do this kind of electronic standard terms and conditions, then you simply need to make sure that you keep them well maintained. Right. But that's in many ways not different from what it used to be. In code terms, I think, are important to flag because very often in litigation you find that, that parties say, yes, but actually you, you don't have jurisdiction because in code term X, Y, and Z apply. X works, for instance, and they say in code term X works basically means that we've also agreed to choice of court in the place where the good was manufactured. Right? X delivery would then say, well, that basically means that we've done a choice of court and perhaps even choice of law in favor of the place where we have delivered these goods. That doesn't fly. Court of Justice, Electro Steel, uh, applied recently, you have a number of cases there, Dutch cases as it happened, but there's plenty in the various member states, which basically say, look, in court terms, I wouldn't rely on them as choice of court or choice of law. You may be able, but you may be able, but it's quite a high burden of proof to say, look, in the steel transport sector, for instance, it is customary that when we use X works, we also therefore imply choice of court and choice of law in favor of the place of manufacturing. If you somehow can establish that this is customary, lex mercatoria, if you like, in the steel transport sector, then great. I think that should be able to be accepted because it's a lex mercatoria idea. But it's going to be quite a um, heavy proof. Not impossible, there's some Irish and Danish case law that has upheld it in certain circumstances. I've also, but this was something which Tania will discuss with you, the fact that no, there's no longer a requirement for, uh, sorry, for uh, domicile of one of the parties in the EU, and Talia, I think, has already mentioned this. Um, this, of course, is an important change uh, in the regulation. Domicile, uh, I won't say too much about it, Article 62, 63, sorry I mentioned 60 earlier, but that's of course the old um, numbering, 62, 63, which try and define domicile, um, at least for um, corporations, for natural persons, it's your national definition that will continue to um, apply. Article 63 often leads to what are called positive conflicts, where you have more than one member state um, agreeing that a particular party is domiciled in that state. Right? Because you see in Article 63 that there are three alternative places of domicile, statutory seat, central administration, or principal place of business. It's, of course, perfectly possible that one member state says you have your seat here, and that another member state says, yes, but you have your central pla principal place of business here. Right? And then you have a race to court, whichever gets there first and convinces the court that they are, have their principal place or that the opposing party have their principal place of business there will um, hear the day. Okay, special jurisdictional rules, Article 7, 8 and uh, 9. Some words on those special jurisdictional rules. What's important for those is, first of all, that they come over and above Article 4. We'll come to Article 4 in a minute. Oh, we've already looked at Article 4, the, the general uh, 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 rule of domicile. So Article 7, 8 and 9 give you the possibility to sue somewhere else than in the domicile of the defendant. So they come over and above domicile of the defendant. They're also, of course, again, typically the cases that lead to race to um, court. The two most important categories in Article 7, 1, I think, are matters relating to a contract and then secondly, matters related to um, a uh, tort. That's Article 7.2. Um, now, on Article 
I just want to say, um, yeah, very briefly, because it's an article that has provoked an awful lot of um, uh, case law. So Article 7.1 simply reads, in matters relating to a contract, in the courts for the place of performance of the obligation in question. Right? That used to be the only provision in the Brussels Convention. This then led to what is called the conflicts method of determining jurisdiction. What is meant by that? It basically meant that under the old system, or let me put it differently, I think you will feel intuitively that depending on the law that applies, depending on your own national legal principles, the place of performance of the obligation in question may well differ, right? If you ask, for instance, an English lawyer, what is the place of performance of the sale of a movable good, then they will say it's the place where the price of that sale needs to be paid, right? If you ask most continental lawyers, they will say it's the place of delivery. If you ask Australian lawyers, they will probably say it's the place where the contract was agreed. Now, they, they, those may be three different places, and I do acknowledge, of course, that Australia is not an EU uh, member state. But you get the challenge, right? If all you're saying is the place of performance of the obligation in question, then you get three different answers, perhaps even more depending on where you sue. And that again flies in the face of um, autonomous interpretation and legal certainty. So as a result, the regulation now harmonizes this. So this is kind of like an embryonical use commune, right? It harmonizes this for two very standard contracts, namely sale of goods and provision of services. So the regulation now says, if it's a contract, if it's a sale of a good, then the place in the member state where under the contract the goods were delivered, or should have been delivered, that's your place of performance. So if you like, that's the continental approach. In the case of provision of services, the place in the member state where under the contract the services were provided or should have been provided. So for those, those two fairly standard contracts, there now will be legal certainty. For anything else that falls outside it, you still have the old method of the so-called conflicts rule, right? Now, I do realize, and this is a little parenthesis, of course, in the meantime, we have harmonized some of that conflicts exercise precisely by having the Rome 1 regulation on applicable law to contracts. So, in other words, by virtue of the existence of Rome 1, the courts should now use the same law to establish where the place of performance is. But not always, because Rome 1 as well, this is not a seminar on Rome 1, we'll have to do that another time, but Rome 1 also acknowledges that, there's con that there will continue to be many contracts where European law doesn't manage to harmonize applicable law, where it will still be down to what is called the law of the characteristic performance. And that, again, is subject to national interpretation. Right? So what I'm trying to say is, what you see in Article 7.1 is the EU, as much as possible, pushing the boat out on harmonizing this connecting factor. The more it can harmonize, the more you get legal certainty. But as it pushes that boat out, it meets resistance from the member states. Because the English say, well, shouldn't it be? What's wrong with place of payment of the, of the good or payment of the service? And the Dutch will say, well, yeah, what's wrong with place of delivery? It's the natural place where this is, this is the natural core of that contract. So you cannot, so there's a limit to how much you can harmonize in European private law by using private international law regulations. And the court bumps into this again and again in its case law. Hunter, the case I've mentioned um, earlier, Refcomp, very good example. Corman Collin, perhaps, if you're interested. Corman Collin, it's on one of the slides. I'm not sure where. Uh, I think I have it somewhere. Oh, it's not, perhaps, write it down. Corman Collin, so C-O-R-M-A-N hyphen Collin, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. Corman Collin, which concerned concession contracts. Concession contracts. Are they a service or are they a good? In the end, the court went for service. But the Advocate General said, what if the court says it's neither services nor goods? 
So we're back in Article 71A, characteristic performance. And the, the Advocate General, um, I think it was Yaskin and can't be sure, I think it was Yaskin and can't be sure, said, well, we're still stuck here. I cannot suggest a European, a European approach to characteristic performance of concession contracts. It's down to the national law of the member states, what they see as that characteristic um, performance. And it's not the Court of Justice's task to do it instead of European harmonization. An interesting opinion, I think, to show you exactly what I mean by the EU push the boat out, but at some point you bump into the boundaries of what you can do with European private international law. 7.3, a classic, a classic, and also I think a classic tragic case law almost of the European Court of Justice. Why? 7.3 says, sorry, 7.2, I always say 7.3, it used to be 5.3. 7.2, in matters relating to tort, delict or quasi-delict, in the courts of the place where the harmful event occurred or may occur. Now, what has happened there is, in this case, beer, which is a fairly straightforward case, upstream pollution, pollutes a waterway, downstream a variety of companies can no longer use the water for their production, including for the production of uh, beer. Yeah. So you get downstream and then you get diffuse damage, but that caused to different uh, people and a fairly easy location of where that damage actually took place. And what does the court say in beer? It says actually if we only accept the place of the, where the event occurred, the so-called locus delicti commissi, then the court said, well, that's very often the same as the domicile of the defendant, which we already have in Article 4. So that's not going to really add anything to Article 4, or as it then was Article 2. Therefore, the court said, why don't we also add the place of the, the, the course of the place where the damage occurred, the so-called locus damni, at the afolk ought. But the damage occurred. Why? Because that at least expands the jurisdictional possibilities, which is what Article 7 intended. And moreover, the court said, that's also actually a very practical court to look at this case, because that's the place where the damage occurred. That court will quite easily be able to assess that damage. They can appoint local experts that will go and inspect the damage and potentially might also now in Rome 2 apply. But that wasn't the case when uh, 7172 was included. 53 initially, they will also apply locus damni, lex locus damni, to this uh, incident. Right? So you can see, I think, in many ways, why when the court extended Article 7 to, to both locus damni and locus delicti commissi in beer, it was fairly inoffensive. But the result, of course, has been a complete avalanche of cases where, you know, this kind of, in many ways, speaking in the beer sort of uh, facts of the case, where this kind of polluting element just kept on reverberating and rippling. Because, of course, from the moment you start saying the law, the place where the damage occurred, all sorts of questions arose, such as what if I suffer damage as a result of somebody else already having suffered damage, right? Typical example, I go and ski in Austria, some Ruritanian bumps into me on the ski slopes, um, I can no longer work for four weeks. My employer suffers damage. They have to appoint an interim teacher, or if I'm in the law firm, they have to they lose a number of cases, and so on. So my employer has suffered damage as a result of me having harmed my legs on the slopes in Austria, right? That's so-called ricochet damage. The employer, of course, will say, well, I suffered this damage here in my consolidated accounts, which might be, uh, if we believe the global media, in Panama, for instance, right? Um, or, or in London, if that's where your registered accounts are. So they will say, this is where I've suffered my damage. So you get all sorts of questions and also a lot of case law where the Court of Justice has basically had to massage this initial beer judgment. So it looked like a good idea, but actually it opened up an awful lot of complication. Because the Court have basically, since beer, have had to be saying, okay, look, it's done, but not in this case, or only direct damage and not indirect damage, which leads to all sorts of questions as to what direct damage is and what indirect damage is, and what one tort is, and when a new tort arises, right? It could very well be the case under certain applicable laws, the example I gave of the skier, that there's a new tort, an original tort, that is established between the Ruritanian that bumped into your employee and you as an employer, right? It could very well be that that is not a ricochet tort, but an initial, an original tort between you and that person. 
because they should have known that if you go and bump into people on the ski slopes being drunk, for instance, that you might endanger a whole set of events, that you might damage their families and their employers, right? And there certainly would be laws where this is the case. So lots of questions on this issue. Recent cases going through the court, one of them I think that's quite interesting and that will have a judgment probably still before the summer is universal music, universal music. That's a case where the only damage is economic damage. A bit of a nightmare for lawyers, that case. Why? It was a case where um, there was a dispute between one of the subsidiaries of Universal Music, BV, and some party, I forget. Um, they had a dispute and they settled. But the law firm that advised Universal Music subsidiary had wrongly calculated the damages, right? So the settlement was far too generous. A nightmare, because I think many of us lawyers, you know, I, I used to practice competition law and also a bit of anti-dumping. And if I think of all the numbers that I've had to juggle, I'm thinking, my goodness, that's the sort of thing that could easily happen, right? So the, the settlement was way too generous. Universal Music BV pays, even though they're nothing at all to do with the initial tort, but they're the mother company. They pay and they now sue the law firm, right? And they sued them in the Netherlands, even though the events leading to the settlement took place in, I think, Germany or Austria, I forget. Uh, and even though the settlement also took place completely outside of the, of, of the Netherlands. So there's no link between the case and the Netherlands other than that the purely economic loss is suffered in the Netherlands. Right? Has took there, uh, uh, sorry, Spooner, Spooner um, uh, and I sympathize. I like Advocate General Spooner. He often thinks out of the box and he's not scared to say that, you know, he disagrees with what the court has decided in B. It's, well, it's one of the many reasons I like him. And he suggests in universal music we shouldn't apply locus damni in cases of purely economic loss. It's going to lead to too many complications. I don't think the court is going to agree. Because as I said, the court has been massaging beer, but it's never let go of the judgment. And I don't think they will in this particular case either, but we'll see. Article eight is a very important, very important um, article. Article eight, uh, one um, and two, but one uh, in particular, the purpose of Article 8, these are so-called anchor defendants, right? Anchor defendants. So what do you do here? You basically have one defendant against whom domicile is easily established. For instance, because, or particularly because they have, sorry, against which jurisdiction is easily established, particularly because they have a domicile in that particular member state, right? Article 8, 1 then says, a person domiciled in a member state may also be sued where he's one of a number of defendants in the course of the place where any one of them is domiciled, provided the claims are so closely connected that it is expedient to hear and determine them together to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments resulting from separate proceedings. What does this say? This basically says it's a bit of an equivalent of the lis alibi pendants rule or a kind of add-on to it. What it basically says is, look, Let's try and um, rationalize court proceedings. If we have one event that has caused many liabilities, many parties involved, um, etc., who could potentially all be sued in different places on the basis of Article 4, right? But it's essentially the same case. If we have different courts hear that case, then those courts might very well, of course, on the basis of the same facts and so on, come to very, very different conclusions. Very different conclusions. And at the recognition and enforcement stage, that will lead to all sorts of problems. Because there might be defenses raised at another court in another state, or there indeed a court in the same state where enforcement of another court judgment is being asked, has issued something completely differently in what is essentially the same case. Therefore, Article 8 says, and it makes sense from a judicial management point of view, let's try and concentrate these cases in one court. Right? Rather than all these plaintiffs um, suing defendants in different places or basically on the same facts, we'll try and group them um, together. There's no obligation. There's no obligation, but you can. Huh? Now, of course, the reality is that you may be tempted as a litigator to abuse Article 8.1, right? And this is, in fact, very often what happens, and a very classic example is the Belgian agency law, the Belgian law on the protection of the agent in agency relations, 
which on the Belgian law is ordre public. So a Belgian court will always apply the Belgian agency law, even though a choice of law has been made for a different court. From the moment the case is heard in a Belgian court, Belgian agency law will apply and the agent will be fairly nicely protected. Right? So if you represent the agent in an international case, you try and find the so-called Belgian connection. Right? You try and find a Belgian anchor defendant. Why? Because you know that the moment the case ends up in Belgium, Belgian law will be applied by that court. And there's many other examples of that in different jurisdictions. Right? This, of course, is forum shopping. Forum shopping. You want to end up in one particular court for all sorts of reasons. Because that court is fast or slow, huh? if that's to your advantage. Because that, f that court has a lot of know-how on intellectual property, for instance, or not at all, if that's to your advantage. Or because that court is cheap or expensive. Or you can get your fund expenses back or not, and so on and so forth. All sorts of reasons why you may want to go to a particular court. And what you do in Article 8.1 is you say, I'm going to find someone who I can somehow connect to this case and use them as an anchor defendant. So what I'm trying to say is that there are many kosher applications of Article 8.1 uh, precisely with a view to rationalizing court's time and proceedings. But at the same time, there's also abuse. And the Court of Justice and Article 8 itself sort of somehow have to reconcile these two. So somehow you find the Court of Justice trying to avoid abuse of Article 8.1, but not wanting to go too far in that because, of course, it's very difficult to detect abuse, isn't it? Right. An interesting case, which I think is on the slide, is um, CDC, or perhaps I have it later. CDC, I have it on one of the, next, the, couple, uh, the following slides. CDC, capital C, capital D, capital C. This was a company that specializes in buying up claims. So you buy a claim, somebody has a claim outstanding, you buy it, you pay them something like 50% or 70%, whatever the case may be, of what they could potentially get um, as a plaintiff. You are then subrogated in all the rights and obligations of this plaintiff, and then you yourself take the case to court. So CDC was one of those cases where CDC bought a cartel claim. So there were a number of companies that had suffered damage as a result of chemical companies having run a, an illegal cartel. And there was a commission judgment, or sorry, decision, saying X penalties for the, all these companies in the cartel involved. You buy up that claim, and CDC then went to Germany, even though there was only one of the chemical companies involved, that was a German company. Right? And what happened is that CDC then went to Germany, so used this German company defendant as an anchor defendant to then pull in something like seven or eight different chemical companies from all over the European Union. They wanted to sue in um, Germany, right? But before the case even came to court, so the case is initiated, the moment of initiation, CDC settled with the German defendant, right? So the German defendant will even be dropped from the case as a settlement. So it's quite obvious that they simply used this German defendant as an anchor defendant and then let go of them, because they're really after all these other guys, right? There the Court of Justice said, in those particular cases where you are colluding with one of the defendants to trigger Article 8.1, that the court says is an abuse and should not be tolerated and Article 8.1 will not stand, which I think actually in those particular circumstances is a bit of a shame. Right? It's a bit of a shame because, you know, these other seven companies were definitely culprits and had definitely acted illegally as established by the European uh, a commission decision. So I think the court was perhaps a little bit too absolute. Uh, yes, there was collusion, but I think it served many interesting purposes that I think were perfectly um, justifiable. But that's the way it is. Remember that case, um, CDC. For excluded matters, and for matters that are not civil and commercial, the regulation doesn't apply, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be excluded. The regulation is completely outside of the um, uh, 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 radar. But for Article 6, the regulation doesn't assign jurisdiction, private international law of the member states does, but the resulting judgment does enjoy 
recognition and enforcement under Title III of the regulation. Right? That's quite attractive. That's quite attractive. It's attractive, of course, because, as you'll see later, recognition and enforcement under the Brussels I regulation is fairly straightforward. That's the whole point of the regulation, free movement of judgments. So the moment you have a judgment that is covered by Brussels I recast, it'll be very difficult for it not to travel freely. And therefore, Article 6 is quite crucial, because even if it will be a national jurisdictional rule that will assign jurisdiction in a civil and commercial case, that judgment will travel under the Brussels I recast in terms of uh, recognition and um, enforcement. That, uh, that really is quite um, attractive. Loss of jurisdiction, you will look at this alibi pendants. So I will not really um, talk about it. Perhaps I shouldn't talk about it um, at all. That's probably the best. Um, provisional, since someone else is going to. Provisional measures I don't think is really addressed by um, anyone else. This is now Article 35. This is interesting, and there's also been a number of very important changes, I think not always for the better, in the um, recast. Article 35 talks about provisionary measures, right? Now, be, be careful Article 35. Courts that have jurisdiction under any of the rules in the regulation will have jurisdiction also for provisional measures. That's not what Article 35 is about, right? So if you have jurisdiction on the basis of Article 24 or Article 7.1 or whatever, then you as that court that has jurisdiction can also issue provisionary measures. That, that's implied with your substantive jurisdiction. Article 35 says something else. Article 35 says that any court, so basically if you like, Article 35 almost takes, but not quite, takes provisionary measures out of the scope of the application of the regulation. It basically says any court even if it doesn't have jurisdiction under the regulation, may issue provisionary measures. But, and this is not what Article 35 says, this is what the Court of Justice um, says. See more below, perhaps I have a slight, oh, I should probably, let me go forward uh, to this, yeah, this slide. Yeah. The Court of Justice has said, Article 35, we do need to discipline it. You can only have jurisdiction under Article 35, for starters, if your measure is indeed provisionary, not if what you issue as a provisionary measure is going to have a lasting impact on the case. And secondly, the court said, and this is Denny Lara, you also need to have a, sorry, Van Uden, you also have to have a link. There needs to be a link between the case and the court which issues the provisionary measures. Right? So there needs to be a link and the measures need to be provisionary. If you don't have a link and or if your measures are lasting, then Article 35 will not be engaged and also you will not therefore enjoy recognition and um, enforcement. Yeah. Now, Article 35 in and of itself has not changed in the regulation, but Article 2, combined with a number of recitals of the regulation, have severely restricted the effect, the effectiveness even, of provisionary measures issued by courts which do not have jurisdiction on the basis of any of the jurisdictional rules of the regulation. Namely by saying that if indeed you are a court that doesn't have substantive jurisdiction on the, the regulation, you issue provisionary measures in accordance with the rule that it has to be provisionary measures and that there is a link between the territory and the case, then the regulation now says that those provisionary measures will no longer enjoy recognition and enforcement under the Brussels I recast. Right. That's a shame because beforehand, although it was disputed, but beforehand there was quite a lot of court practice that accepted that provisionary measures issued by courts that do not have substantive matter jurisdiction enjoyed freedom of movement as a judgment under Title III of the regulation. That's now no longer the case. That doesn't mean that you cannot have such provisionary measures recognized and enforced, but you have to go outside of the regulation. You have to use the traditional residual 
private international law rules to try and get your judgment recognized and enforced. And those rules tend to be much more cumbersome in terms of exequatur and so on and so forth. Right? So that's a shame. What's also a shame, though, perhaps even in a way, I suppose this first pity is perhaps to some degree understandable, but what's also a shame is that the regulation now says that for provisionary measures ex parte, so measures that you request without the other party even being notified, right? Those, of course, are very attractive. They're not always possible, but often they are, and often they're also necessary. If you're going to have bank seizure, then you don't want to tell your opponent, by the way, tomorrow I'm going to court to have your bank account seized. There will, there will be nothing left to seize. So you want to have an ex parte measure, and it's perfectly justifiable. The regulation now says that ex parte provisionary measures, where the opposing party against whom the measures are enforced, or are sought to be enforced, has not been um, uh, uh, subpoenaed or has not been asked to appear in the initial proceeding, that they will only enjoy Title III of the regulation, so easy recognition and enforcement, only, uh, only once the opposing party has been notified. Right? So the regulation says you can still get your measures ex parte, but if you ever want to take those measures to the member state where you need to seize, we will not recognize and enforce under Title III unless you notify the other party. So again, your, your, your impact is lost. Right? Your impact is lost. The moment you notify, of course, things will disappear. That doesn't apply to big stock or warehouses, obviously. But it does apply to partic particularly bank seizure. Yeah. Does this exclude a provisionary measure to be an executive and serve at the same time? Because that's usually the way it's done. You turn up with the bailiff at the defense. That could work. That could work. Then you serve it and then you search yourself. That could work, but only indeed, of course, if the civil law, laws of, rules of civil procedure of the member state where you seek recognition and enforcement allow such um, uh, uh, conjoint uh, seizure and notification, which isn't always the case. But yes, I think that should work. Otherwise, it's completely pointless. Otherwise, there's no point. Unless if it's physical goods. Okay. A warehouse full of tractors is probably not easily moved within, uh, in a day, but, but probably in a day and a half. Um, so yes, but it depends. But I would say yes, that should be, that should be possible. Otherwise, there's no point at all. So provisional measures, I don't think such a handy um, um, change, but we'll see perhaps. Uh, there is a sort of conspiracy theory, which to a degree has been launched by myself. Um, um, namely, the commission says, look, the commission says the reason why we need to curtail these provisionary measures under the regulation is because they're just too diverse across the member states. There's too much, dif there's too much, too much difference between them. Um, and it makes it very difficult to, when you receive such a uh, provisionary measure that you're asked to enforce, you know, too many of those will be completely alien to the system of the state in which enforcement is sought. Why, where is the conspiracy theory? I suppose conspiracy theory lies in the fact that, of course, if the commission were to be able to show in, or if in three or four years' time, everyone will start complaining, um, insolvency practitioners, uh, uh, or practitioners generally, or insurance companies, and so on and so forth, will start saying, look, as a result of this rule, we now have you know, a very important and relevant part of legal practice that is completely lost, then that might be a moment for the Commission to say, well, you know what the answer to that is? We should be harmonizing provisionary measures. We should be harmonizing rules of civil procedure. But it's a conspiracy theory, which I think I dreamt up at some point, probably working late or something. Um, I'm not sure whether that's actually intended, but you can see where that it might lead to such a um, conclusion. Okay, I have, and you will have noticed, and I'm sorry, I'll have to go back a little bit. I just wanted to flag um, some changes um, to the regulation, but I think I've already highlighted uh, most of them. Um, the previous slide, by the way, says what, I've, what I think is now abundantly clear to you, which is that it's not easy to work with the regulation if you don't have all this background of all that case law. Um, and, you know, that's just the way it is, it's, I think, a little bit different from other European uh, law, but, but, um, but there you go. Um, so changes, and this I want to flag perhaps very, very briefly, very interesting report, which perhaps you may have already 
um, heard of, which is this Heidelberg report. Yeah? Very useful. And you have these reports also, for instance, with the recast of the insolvency regulation. And there'll be similar reports with the uh, potential recast of Rome 1 and so on. This is a report which was produced to, um, to, um, yeah, to, to take stock of how the regulation was being applied in what were then the 15 member states. And it's very useful. It's a very long, lengthy report. You can just find it on the internet. Um, because it lists an, a wide variety of national cases on how these various articles were being applied. So it's very interesting if ever you bump into a practical problem, um, have a look at the Heidelberg report and see perhaps whether one of your colleagues in a different member state at some point also had a similar problem and that is reported in the Heidelberg report. It might give you inspiration, bearing into account, of course, that the rule in the meantime may have changed. But nevertheless, it will be interesting to see what was concluded in another um, case. Um, so what are the mo main impacts? This I've already mentioned, the international impact of the regulation. Professor Kruger, I'm sure, will have flagged that the European Commission wanted to increase the scope of application even more than it has done, or than eventually the regulation does. Initially, the regulation would have had a much wider international impact, for instance, by including an assets rule, which would have allowed jurisdiction on the basis of there being enough assets in the European Union present against which enforcement could be sought even if the case was not at all to do with the European Union. None of that has been accepted, right? None of that has been um, accepted. Um, um, and you see that here on these slides. Again, you'll get the slides. Parliament in particular was a little bit cautious because they said, if you're going to expand these international rules, then we probably should be doing that in conjunction or at least in dialogue with our trading partners. Um, we shouldn't just do it unilaterally, which is why in the end they... Um, held back. Um, this though is interesting, the new lease dependence rule, you will talk about it I'm sure later in the program. Um, there's a new rule now which talks about proceeding spending in another court and therefore also a, not an obligation in this case, but a possibility for the European court that is seized to stay its case if those proceedings are pending outside of the EU outside of the EU. That's entirely new, entirely new. That'll be a very, very interesting application because it's got a wider scope than generally thought. And you can see in Article 33 that it tries to somehow discipline courts in the member states by not making them use this, 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 this rule too widely. Um, basically, the European Union don't want to include or want to introduce a so-called forum non convenience rule. They don't want European courts to be able flexibly to say this, this case should really be heard in Panama or in Delaware or in uh, Moscow, for instance. Right? That's not what they want. They want to have fairly strict rules of jurisdiction. But there is now a new Lissal dependence rule, which I think will allow some of those forum non convenience type um, methodology in the regulation. The changes in choice of courts, I've put it on this slide just to highlight the differences, but um, you will talk, uh, uh, Talia this afternoon will talk about it a bit more, specifically because the um, new regulation now settles to some degree the question as to what law decides on the substantive validity of a choice of court agreement. Classic examples in practice are unilateral jurisdictional jurisdiction clauses. Right? So a unilateral jurisdiction clause, which one finds a lot in the finance sector. I think I have that on the um, next slide and this slide as well. So unilateral clauses you find a lot in the finance sector, where you may find that if you have a loan agreement, that the bank will say, or let me say that the client rather, will be obliged and will be tied to one particular court. The client will have to sue in Frankfurt but where the bank will be allowed to sue, sometimes it's mentioned nominatim, Frankfurt or London or Madrid. Sometimes it's phrased in uh, less specific terms. For instance, the bank, this is, you see that quite regularly, the bank can sue anywhere under the relevant rules of the Brussels I um, regulation, right? Um, or anywhere where the bank has a subsidiary, they can sue. The reason behind that, of course, is that they want to follow the money. So basically, even a finance agreement, you want to make sure as a bank that you'll be able to sue 
where the actual assets of the client are. Now, in a, in a course, in just ordinary people like you and I, it's fairly clear where our assets are. They're most probably in just one particular place. And, you know, if you have a mortgage, then even that is not really an asset, it's a debt. Um, but, but in other uh, clients, they may, um, you know, they may, especially commercial clients, they'll move across the EU, sometimes fairly quickly. And as a bank, you want to be able to very quickly uh, sort of play with this and make sure that you can sue wherever the assets um, happen to be. That's a unilateral clause. Whether that is valid or not is very much dependent on your national law. Luxembourgish law, English law, perfectly fine. French law, very problematic. Belgian law, acceptable to some degree. German law, again, sometimes yes, most often not. So it very much depends that you know beforehand what law will apply to the validity of this agreement. The Brussels 1 regulation recast now says it's the Lex 40 prorogati. But if your 40 prorogati is many fora, right? How do you then determine the Lex 40 prorogati? You, you can't, because the bank can sue almost anywhere. So, yeah. Sorry, we have to, for the tape, I think. But if a party in a contract is a consumer, then we have Article 18. And yeah. we also have jurisprudence. We have ban on GSM. It can be abusive and considered as such. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Indeed, these kinds of considerations, Article 25, only applies when, when, when the consumer title doesn't apply. And the same with employment contracts. And it's, it's good that you point that out because you mustn't forget it. Article 25 is only really engaged in a B2B situation or perhaps in a B2C, but if that B2C is not covered by Article 17 and following, absolutely. Yeah. And that, of course, is much less, uh, much less um, flexible. Um, but Talia will talk more about choice of court, also the reference to the, or the relation with the Hague um, Convention. Just one point, perhaps, which I've got on here. I'm not sure that you'll be able to talk about this in the, um, um, in the course of this uh, training, but bearing in mind is the question of reflexive application of the jurisdictional rules. It's a question that applies, I'm sure Tania will address this. Um, what if, so reflexive application means that you apply the jurisdictional rules of the regulation even if they point to a court outside of the EU, right? Classic examples, Article 24. What if the real estate at issue is located in Washington, right? Or in Harare? Do, can you then must you perhaps even? Can you then stay your proceedings on the basis that you're saying, look, it's the Harare court or the court at Washington that should hear this case. And I should apply Article 24, even if it points away from the EU. In the previous regulation, I think that would have been probably impossible, this kind of reflexive application. The English courts did it for Article 24.2, reflexive application of the corporate rule in Article 24. Too. But I don't think that was entirely um, kosher under the regulation. But now in the recast, there are indications that such reflective application is indeed possible. And it links to the Lis Alibi Pendens Rule. Because one of the recitals of the regulation says that the new Lis Alibi Pendens Rule and one of the considerations that court should, take in, in, should bear in mind when they apply this Lis Alibi Pendens Rules rule vis-a-vis -vis courts of third states, that one of those considerations is whether that court would have had exclusive jurisdiction had it been an EU court. Yeah. That probably applies both to Article 24 and to Article 25, because Article 25, choice of court, is also in principle exclusive. So there's some question marks, but I think probably quite a bit of indication that those exclusive rules should apply um, reflexively. Um, I have, I think that's probably, yeah, arbitration I won't talk about. Um, I think Professor Kruger has already flagged it this morning. Lots of problems, lots of excitement in the arbitration community. Look at Gazprom there as well, the opinion of the Advocate General. Provisionary measures I've mentioned. Anchor defendants I've already mentioned. Here is the case, I think, uh, CDC. Yeah, there's that case that I mentioned on the chemicals um, cartel, the CDC case. Um, 
And yeah, this finally, this is the final slide. Uh, uh, just an indication. This is the hypnotizing moment again. Um, uh, just some recent uh, postings which I've had on the blog. I've probably spoken way too fast. I flagged things that I shouldn't have done. I've probably forgotten an awful lot of other stuff um, for which I apologize. Um, if you have any questions, please do, I suppose, ask them now. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be here this afternoon. I have six hours of teaching still at, um, at the faculty. Um, but I'm sure you'll find me if, if you have anything that I've said which is still unclear. Quite a few of those things will still be addressed by the other speakers in the remaining programme. So, thank you. Thank you.